Hi YouTube, now part three to continue with our discussion of Jihad Nishariya and Ibn Taymiyyah's book on Jihad. I have mentioned that fitna must be prevented. That means any kind of corruption, which is actually just temptation. And also all religion on earth must be for Allah alone. That's what this means. Religion, worship, that all worship will be only for Allah. So in other words, any other form of religion or to move away from Islam, that is fitna. Let's go back to Reliance of the Traveler and let's go back to their definition of jihad and discussion of jihad in this book. Note what it says here. They discuss the final descent of Jesus and after the final coming of Jesus, nothing but Islam will be accepted from people. Jesus will rule by the law of Muhammad. So Jesus will not rule by the gospel. Jesus will be a Muslim. He will come down, he will break the cross, in other words, destroy the church, and he will rule with Muhammad. Right, so he will come down at the right hand of Muhammad, fight the Christians, destroy the church, and he will then impose Islam. This is the Islamic view. As they say, he will not rule according to the Evangel, but as a follower of our prophet Muhammad. Now, section 09.9. .9. The Caliph fights all other peoples until they become Muslim. That should be self-explanatory. Even idol worshippers either become Muslim or agree to pay the poll tax. Now, there are different rulings that say that people who do not have a book do not have the option of a poll tax. It's either become Muslim or they are killed. Right, let's go down to section 09.12. Whoever enters Islam before being captured may not be killed, nor his property confiscated, nor his young children taken captive. So if you become Muslim, your blood and your possessions are saved. When a child or woman is taken captive, they become slaves. That, I think, is entirely self-explanatory. In Islamic warfare, when a child or woman is taken captive, they become slaves by the fact of capture, and the woman's previous marriage is immediately annulled. This is Sharia law. ISIS practiced this, and you will hear constantly, but they weren't real Muslims. Well, the fact is, they were strictly practicing the Islamic Sharia they are real Muslims. Let me clarify a point. Let's define what Islam is according to the Sharia. Looking at chapter U2.0 under the heading Islam, it says here in U2.1, Islam is to testify that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. To perform the prayer, give zakat, fast in Ramadan and perform the pilgrimage to the house if you can find a way. That is Islam defined formally within the Sharia, within the reliance of the traveler. Section U, 2.2, Nawawi. Nawawi is one of the 24 major scholars of Islam. This is one of the Sheikh al-Islam. The Sheikh and Imam Ibn Salah, Allah have mercy on him, said, being a Muslim is outwardly established by one saying the two testifications of faith, Shahadatain, even if they are not spoken in Arabic. Interesting point. The Prophet only added the prayer, zakat, the pilgrimage, and the fast because they are the most patent and greatest of Islamic observances. One's submission, istislam, is perfected through performing them and neglecting them suggests that one has dissolved or vitiated the terms of one's compliance. Moreover, the term faith, iman, encompasses all of the things by which Islam is explained in this hadith and indeed all acts of obedience for they are the fruits of the inner conviction that is the underlying basis of faith and are what strengthen, complete, and preserve it. So that is Islam explained, what the elements of faith are, and also notice it again refers to hadith. Hadith are critical for the understanding of the Quran and for the understanding of Islam. The Sharia is built upon the Sunnah. The Quran is not sufficient. It is necessary, but it is not sufficient. There's not enough detail in the Quran. The Sharia is not contained in the Quran. In fact, the Shahada itself is not found in the Quran, and how to perform the five daily prayers is not found in the Quran. That is only found in the Sharia. Let's look at section U2.3. Now, they tell you, for instance, ISIS, those weren't real Muslims. Those aren't real Muslims. They're sinful. Well, let's see what the official Orthodox position is. The position of Muslim Orthodoxy is that no Muslim becomes a non-Muslim through sin. Muslims of heretical sectarian groups and those of reprehensible innovations, bidda, are not thereby non-Muslims. This is discussed in section W47.2. So, no Muslim becomes a non-Muslim through sin. ISIS are thereby Muslim. Muslims of heretical sects and those of who practice reprehensible innovations of bidda are not thereby non-Muslims.
Muslims. I think that should be clear. That defines what Muslims are. And that isn't so committing sin is not how Muslims become non Muslims. Going further, let us define some terms. We start using terms, and unfortunately, these terms are legal terms. Therefore, they have a certain meaning to them. They're jargon. They're actually legal jargon within Islam. They're not necessarily used or understood in the colloquial way that we understand them. But let us be precise. Let us define what these terms are. And here we have chapter C 2.0 called Types of Human Act. Download a copy of these manuals. This one is the easier to read one. It's neat. The other one is the scanned one. It's harder to read. This one is just so much easier. It has a working index as well, a hyperlinked index. So, yeah, I switch between the two of them all the time. Chapter C, 2.0, Types of Human Act, and they have defined in the C 2.1 the term obligatory. And it says here, the obligatory, or fard, is that which the lawgiver strictly requires to be done. Someone who performs an obligatory act out of obedience to Allah is rewarded. A person who refrains from it without excuse deserves to be punished. In the Shafi school, there is no difference between obligatory, fard, and requisite, wajib. Interesting point. So there are obviously slight differences between the four major schools of jurisprudence in Sunni Islam. And of course, you have the fifth school, the Jafari school from Iran, the Shia school, which is actually recognized. C2.2, recommended or sunnah. Sunnah means recommended. The sunnah or recommended mandub is that which the lawgiver asks to be done, but does not strictly require it. Someone who performs it out of obedience to Allah is rewarded though someone who refrains from it is not punished. The word permissible, section C 2.3. The permissible, mubah, is what the lawgiver has neither requested nor prohibited. The person who does it is not rewarded or punished, rather doing it or not doing it are equal. Though, if a person does it to enable him to perform an act of obedience to Allah, or refrains from it for that reason, then he is rewarded for it. And if he does such an act to enable him to perform an act of disobedience, then he is sinning. And of course, let's skip to C2.5, unlawful. Unlawful, haram, is what the lawgiver strictly forbids. Now, in different sections of the Quran, they define the lawgiver as being synonymous with either Allah or Muhammad. Right? The two are synonymous. So the lawgiver could be Allah or Muhammad. The word of Muhammad is the word of Allah. Haram is what the lawgiver strictly forbids. Someone who commits an unlawful act deserves punishment. One who refrains from it out of obedience to the command of Allah is rewarded. And finally, scholars distinguish between three levels of the unlawful. One, minor sins, which may be forgiven from prayer to prayer, from one Friday prayer to another, and so forth, as is mentioned in Hadith. Again, the Sharia relies on Hadith. Hadith explain the Quran. Two, enormities, kabir, those which appear by name in the Quran or Hadith as the subject of an explicit threat, prescribed legal penalty, or curse as listed below at book P. Book P is labeled enormities. And three, unbelief, kufr, sins which put one beyond the pale of Islam as discussed at section 08.7 and necessitate stating the testification of faith, the shahada to re-enter Islam. Hopefully now we have a clearer understanding of what these terms mean and how we can understand Islam. Let's finish our reading about what jihad is legally how it is legally defined in the sharia last couple of sentences section 09.14 when an adult male is taken captive the caliph decides the interests of islam and the muslims he decides between the prisoner's death slavery release without paying anything or ransoming him if the prisoner becomes a muslim then he may not be killed and one of the other three alternatives is chosen Again, it shows you that if they say the Shahada and they become a Muslim, their blood and their possessions are saved. This is in compliance with the Quran. Section 09.15, our final line, it is permissible in jihad to cut down the enemy's trees and destroy their dwellings. I mention this because it is very common for Muslim apologists to flat out lie and state Islam has the most beautiful rules of war. You're not allowed to cut down trees. You have to leave buildings stand. Nonsense. Nonsense. Ask them for the reference to that. And if that reference exists, it is overruled by the Sharia. And if it's in the Quran, then that, that, that verse is mansuk. 
it is abrogated, it is cancelled. I will end this here and we'll move on to the next section in the next video. But thank you for watching. Please like, please share, please subscribe. If you have any comments, leave them down below. Thank you. Goodbye.